I think my favourite of the animals we went to see was the kakapo, which is a... Ah, oh, some kakapo fans in the audience. <laughs> um, kakapo is the world's largest, fattest, and least able to fly parrot. <laughs> Lives in New Zealand. Um, it's... It has, as I say, forgotten how to fly. Sadly, it has also forgotten that it's forgotten how to fly. <laughs> so a seriously worried kakapo will occasionally run up a tree and jump out of it. <laughs> Opinion divides as to what then happens. Some people will tell you that the kakapo um, has some sort of rudimentary parachuting ability. <laughs> Other people will tell you that it flies like a brick. Um, <laughs> But the point is that Kakapos very rarely, get, very rarely get seriously worried because of where they grew up, which is they grew up on New Zealand. Now, New Zealand is a very interesting country in that um, it was not, as I say, part of Austra Australasia. It wasn't part of Gondwanaland. It was just this load of gunk that came up from out of the ocean uh, with the result that it had no life on it. Other than a few dead fishes, I suppose, but it had... <laughs> So the only life that got to New Zealand was the life that could fly there, i.e. birds. So, bir so New Zealand was entirely populated by birds, uh, other than a couple of species of bats, which are mammals, as you'll know, but uh, the principle holds good. You had to fly there to get there. Um, with the result that the, the ecology of, of New Zealand was sort of slightly unbalanced, and there was nothing living on the ground. And there were no predators on New Zealand. Now, growing up in, a, in, a, in an environment with no predators is something that is almost hard for us to imagine because we are used to dealing with the world kind of warily. You know, you meet somebody new, you size them up before you, 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 know, you, know, you know how you're going to be involved with them. We, we tend to be suspicious, wary, cautious creatures by nature. Uh, you'll, you'll, you'll size up a situation before you get involved in it. And that's because we grew up like most animals on this planet, uh, we evolved through, uh, in environments that had predators in them. So we all had to be wary and cautious, and those of us who weren't didn't survive. Now, in New Zealand, there were no predators, so nobody ever learned to worry. Now, actually, the most extreme example of this I know is actually not in New Zealand, but is on the Galapagos Islands, where there is a bird called the blue-footed booby. <laughs> and it's called the blue-footed booby, I'm convinced, for two reasons. One of which has to do with the colour of its feet. <laughs> and the other, the reason it's called a booby, I'm convinced, has to do with this small piece of behaviour. Because you can walk up to a blue-footed booby that's sitting there on the ground or on a branch. You can walk up to it and you can pick it up. Because what the booby will be thinking, and this is why we call it a booby, I think, is that once we finish with it, we'll put it back. <laughs> It doesn't know any different. And the same, the, same was true, the same was true in New Zealand. Because there were no predators, no, no, none of the animals developed any of the, 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 the things that we think of as normal, natural pieces of behavior, which is wariness and caution and a tendency to run like hell. <laughs> and because flying is... One of the functions of flying is that it's an escape mechanism... It's a way you escape something that wants to come and attack you or eat you. And because, because there was nothing on New Zealand that uh, wanted to eat you particularly, um, and because flying is also a rather expensive form of travel... Um, <laughs> now, I'm not talking about the airline cartels. I'm talking, <laughs> I'm talking about the fact that it takes a lot of energy to fly. You have to, you know, beating your wings and keeping yourself aloft takes a lot of energy. And you take energy in in the form of food. And the more, more you, f you uh, eat, the heavier you get, and the more difficult it is to fly. <laughs> so you have to eat a bit, fly a bit, eat a bit, fly a bit. <laughs> it's actually rather a complicated and stressful form of life.
And so because there were no predators on, on, um, uh, on New Zealand and nobody was kind of living on the ground and life always kind of flows into available niches, so a, a number of the animals, if I can be rather naughty and anthropomorphize at the moment, a number of the animals, a number of the birds, kind of is almost as if they sat down and thought up, well, actually, what we, could, we can sit down and have a rather larger meal and just go for a waddle afterwards. <laughs> so eventually, a number of the birds, like the kakapo and the kiwi, which, of course, is a symbol of New Zealand, the weka and one or two other birds, eventually lost the ability to fly. They, just, they evolved into ground-living animals. So, of course, when man finally arrives on New Zealand, bringing with him his his dangerous, deadly menagerie of dogs and cats and stoats and rabbits and that most de- of predatory of all animals, ratus ratus, the ship's rat, which goes with man everywhere, um, suddenly the, uh, the, the birds were waddling for their lives, those, those that knew to do it. But mostly they didn't know to do it. So the kakapo, if confronted with you know, a stoat or something that wants to eat it, simply doesn't know the form. You know, it, doesn't, it hasn't been introduced properly by, by evolutionary <laughs> processes. So he just kind of sits there and waits for the other animal to make the first move, which is usually <laughs> just to kill it. So as a result of this, since man arrived on New Zealand, the population of the kakapo has dropped from, we're not quite certain what it originally was, but somewhere up in hundreds of thousands or, or maybe millions um, of kakapo, has now dropped to a figure that the last, last I heard was about 45 and there is a desperate struggle to try and keep these animals alive because they are completely helpless in the face of anything that might want to attack it. So what are the, what are the animals themselves doing to, to help themselves in this, this evolutionary crisis they've suddenly arrived at? Well, not a lot because we have this problem with the kakapo which is the way in which they reproduce. The mating rituals of the kakapo are incredibly long drawn out, fantastically complicated, and almost totally ineffective. (laughs) Some people will tell you that the mating call of the male kakapo actively repels the female kakapo, (laughs) which is the sort of behaviour you otherwise only find in discotheques. Um, What what the male kakapo does when it comes to mating season is he finds himself a rocky promontory overlooking some vast, wonderful valley because acoustics are very important to what it's about to do. (laughs) And it hollows out this bowl in the ground on this rocky promontory and it sits in it. And it puffs out these two enormous air sacs around its chest, which is going to be reverberation chambers. And it sits there night after night for about 100 nights of the year. For eight, and it performs over and over again for 100 nights of the year, for eight hours a night. It performs over and over again the opening bars of Dark Side of the Moon. Now, those... <laughs> Now, those of you who remember all the way back to the 70s, <laughs> will remember the dark side of the moon starts with this great, deep, thumping heartbeat. And it is, this is the noise the kakapo makes. It's so deep and so reverberant that, in fact, human ears can only just pick it up. I mean, some people will tell you you can't quite hear it to begin with. You more feel it like a reverberation in the pit of your stomach. And then gradually your ear tunes into it, and you hear this great whoomp, whoomp, whoomp heartbeat echoing around the the valleys in New Zealand. 